We have a great afternoon planned. We have um, several um, high yield lectures um, over the next hour and a half or so. And first and foremost um, is Dr. Tamara Kadi, um, who is a uh, pediatrician who practices peds emergency medicine in our emergency department at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital and comes to us um, from Tufts New England Medical Center Floating Hospital for Children. Um, and is going to give us an update on the top pediatric EM articles of 2018. So without further ado, welcome Dr. Gotti. Good morning. Thanks for having me here. Once again, I'm Tamara Cotty from Georgetown's Emergency Department, and I'll be talking to you today about the top pediatric emergency medicine articles of 2019. And one from two, 2018, and one from 2019 <laughs> as well. So let's go over the roadmap for my talk today and take a deep breath. It may, this may seem like a lot, but these are great articles I picked for you. You're gonna learn a lot and we're gonna have fun along the way. So upside down position for SVT. Clinicians versus the head CT decision instrument tools. The pediatric nexus two head CT decision instrument. Pre-procedural fasting and sedation. Fluid infusion rates for DKA acetaminophen and febrile seizure recurrence, risk of death and brew, and if you don't know what brew is, we're gonna talk about that. How long do we need to keep racemic epineb kids around after getting a neb for croup? High flow and Keats asthma in the ED, a clinical prediction rule for low risk serious bacterial infections and fever in those under 60 days of age, and lastly, foreign body ingestion. So again, this might seem like a lot. Take a deep breath. We're going to have fun, and you're going to learn a lot. First up, from the International Journal of Cardiology, the upside-down position for the out-of-hospital management of children with SVT. Now, we're all very familiar with the usual players we use. The barbaric ice to the face, infants, usually ice bags, right? But I searched everywhere online and could not find an image of ice packs to the face. You can find thousands of kids with beer, but none for ice packs to the face. But anyways, getting back to it, we're all familiar with using a straw or 10 ml syringe, and with leg lifts in adults, like the revert study you may remember from Lancet in 2015. So this was a very small Italian study done actually in the home setting, just 24 kids with SVT ages one to 18 years, and these were kids with really simple paroxysmal SVT. Anybody who had a history of being unstable was automatically excluded. And previously there have been just case reports on this, so this is really the first pilot study about this upside down maneuver. You were also excluded if you had any contraindications to being held upside down, like having glaucoma. Now, I didn't know that was a contraindication to be held upside down, but it makes sense. <laughs> Aortic stenosis, any musculoskeletal or pulmonary um, contraindication. So the two groups, the standard Valsalva group was placed in the semi-recumbent position, told to breathe through a 10 ml syringe for 15 seconds. The upside down group, just give me one second to grab my prop, <coughs> were actually held, <laughs> yeah I didn't steal this from you Diana, so. Um, if you were under 30 kilos or uncooperative parents, no ideas here, they were held up by the legs for about 30 seconds. And physiologically what's happening is you're increasing venous return, suddenly stretching the atrium, causing idiopathic converge, cardioversion back to sinus rhythm. Um, if you were over 30 kilos or you could do a handstand, you maintain this against the wall for 30 seconds as well. And now if the first maneuver failed, they reversed the order of maneuvers, and then if that failed, they were sent to the hospital. And then on the next recurrence, they switched the order and kind of followed the same plan. And here's actually an EKG from a kid doing a handstand. You can see it starts out in SVT, and then um, cardioverts back to sinus rhythm. So for first attempt with upside down, 67% of the patients um, it was successful with, compared to 33% who did the Valsalva. If the upside down failed, and they then had to do the Valsalva, none of those kids cardioverted. 
The recurrence groups had similar higher rates of cardioversion with the upside down position as well. However, it's important to note that each of the p-values was not statistically significant. But larger studies may prove that the upside down maneuver is more successful. And the authors are actually planning a multi-center um, trial over two to three years and including kids under age one as well. So the take home from this article needs more validation but you can try it in a stable patient. If it does not significantly delay care, you do not drop them. <laughs> what I envision is someone's getting your ice, bags of ice, your straw, your syringe, your IV set up, your adenosine, and just give it a try at least once for 30 seconds. Um, Got to work around the leads and all those things as well. And if you're at Georgetown, just don't let Dr. Furlong see you do it or Dr. Glasser. Now, if you did drop that child, you're going to want to read this next article. <laughs> so from pediatrics, accuracy of clinician practice compared with three head injury decision rules in children. And this was led by uh, Dr. Franz Babel, who's basically the chair of kind of the equivalent to PCARN here, and it's called PREDICT in Australia and New Zealand. And it was a secondary analysis of a prospective observational study of mild closed head injury in those under 18 years of age. It's pretty big, 20,000 kids in Australia and New Zealand. They wanted to compare physician accuracy on figuring out which kids needed a CT compared to these three commonly used head decision instrument tools. We're all familiar with PCARN. CATCH is from Canada, and CHALICE, of course, is from the UK. They had to name it that. So how do we compare? Well, 8.3% of our patients got a head CT. 0.8% had a clinically um, significant traumatic brain injury. And 0.1% underwent neurosurgery. It missed only two of those 160 with a clinically important traumatic brain injury. And those two were actually picked up a week later due to persistent headaches and no negative sequelae were reported. So we had similar sensitivity, higher specificity, and give yourself a round of applause, clinicians ordered less CTs than the rules would have recommended. So the take home from this one, we are still better than those three decision tools, so trust yourself. And Dr. Munns at Franklin Square will be happy that you did as well. Another head injury article, validation of the pediatric Nexus II head CT decision instrument for selective imaging of PEDS patients with blunt head trauma. This was from Academic EM, um, done by Dr. Malkit Gupta from UCLA. It was a multi-center perspective study over a long time, over nine years, and it was developed as a one-way rule-out tool for a clinician, so they could skip CT in those patients they had already decided to image. And basically, if you had one or more of any of the following risk factors I'm going to go over, you should, it was recommended that you image them. If you had none, you should skip it. So that included skull fracture or scalp hematoma. They had a neurologic deficit, were less alert or altered. They had persistent vomiting or coagulopathy. So the pediatric nexus two, it correctly identified the 27 patients that needed neurosurgical intervention. It identified 48 out of the 49 that had significant intracranial injuries. And the one that it didn't still got a head CT that showed the injury and didn't, she didn't need any neurosurgical intervention as well. Of the 369 patients that did not get a head CT, zero had a clinically important traumatic brain injury. So how did it perform? So for identifying significant injury on CT, the pediatric nexus two had a high sensitivity of 98% and a specificity of 34%. In regards to neurosurgical intervention, it had a high sensitivity, but a pretty wide confidence interval and a reasonably good specificity. So the authors concluded, really use your judgment first then use the decision instrument, which makes sense. And that by doing this, we may reduce CT use in low-risk PEDS by up to 34%. Now, you might be wondering, what's the difference between this pediatric nexus two and the PCARN? Well, the PCARN included all kids with closed head injury, 
whereas the PCARN, whereas the pediatric nexus two really only included those kids that you were really thinking to image. Also, the PCARN study was huge. It had over 42,000 patients in it, whereas this pediatric nexus two only had 1,000. So really at this point, my personal preference is still toward PCARN. So take home, use your clinical judgment first, then apply that decision instrument tool to reduce imaging even further. All right, from JAMA Pediatrics, association of pre-procedural fasting with outcomes of ED sedation in children. This was by Dr. Bott, and not our own esteemed Dr. Hul Bott, but Dr. Mala Bott from Ontario. It's a prospective case series, or 6,000 children in Canadian EDs, and the authors found no association with adverse outcome and duration of fasting prior to procedure. So in the group who had, had solved within less than two hours, they actually had less serious events than the group that had been fasting for over six hours. And they found similar results for liquids as well. They actually estimated that the risk of aspiration with sedation, even though their cohort had no cases of aspiration, is three per 10,000. So the take home on this, we all know what your waiting room looks like. Don't delay sedation for fasting. And Dr. Tekle at Union will be happy that you're moving your patients along. <laughs> and now from the New England Journal of Medicine, go back to that, clinical trial of fluid infusion rates for pediatric DKA. So um, this is by the PCARN group led by Nate Kupperman um, from UC Davis. And the authors really wanted to investigate the idea that initial IV fluids are evil and the cause of brain injury in kids with DKA. It was a randomized controlled study in 13 centers. About 1,300 kids ended up being randomized. And they wanted to compare the rate of administration, saline content of IV fluid, and the effects on the neurologic outcome of kids with DKA. There were four treatment groups. So the FAST group, there were two FAST groups. First FAST group got half normal saline, the other group got regular normal saline. This group got two 10 cc per kilo boluses and each bolus went over 15 to 30 minutes. The slow group of half normal, full normal, <coughs> got one 10 cc per kilo bolus over 15 to 30 minutes. They then went on to replace the fluid deficit in these kids over a longer period of time. I'm not going to get into that here. Their primary outcome was, was what was the decline in mental status during treatment? And they graded this as a decline of a Glasgow coma scale of less than 14 at least two times. Secondary outcome, any clinically apparent brain injury during treatment, short-term memory deficits during treatment, their memory and IQ two to six months after, and they found no differences. Actually, the lowest rate of mental status decline in clinically apparent brain injury was in the rapid group. And they found that the more severe DK groups had faster improvement in digit span recall in that rapid versus slow group. Do you keep in mind that clinically apparent brain injury only occurred in less than 1% of their patients in their study, so it makes it a little bit hard to statistically analyze their outcome. Also, the power of their study was decreased because they did allow for two repeat episodes of DK in the same patient. They also had a very wide range of ages, and only 10% were under six years of age, which we know is thought to be the most vulnerable group in DK for brain injury. But still, their findings are very important and really do add to the debate that we, we don't need to blame the initial IV fluids and those supposed rapid osmotic effects, and that likely the brain injury that we're seeing is a result of a combination of cerebral hypoperfusion, reperfusion injury, and neuroinflammation. So the take home on this, it may be safe to resuscitate your dry DK kids faster than you thought. Do keep in mind that slower resuscitation overall is still equivalent to faster, and we really need more randomized trials on this topic. And as we talk about the future and more trials, this is what we're looking forward to at Georgetown. Um, what are we at, four years now? Maybe eight? Uh, <laughs> but our new pavilion with our new ER as well. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Acetaminophen and febrile seizure recurrences during the same fever episode. This was from pediatrics. So standard kind of current thinking, tell parents this too, is that round the clock antipyretics after a febrile seizure are not going to prevent another febrile seizure from happening in the same febrile episode. So this article makes us question that. So it's done in a 1ED in a Japanese city. Um, it's perspective, open, randomized, controlled study, went over two years. It had about 400 kids, ranged from six months to 60 months of age. They included simple febrile seizures. They also had a huge exclusion list, one of which was diarrhea, and I mentioned that because it'll come up later. And they wanted to compare the febrile seizure recurrence rate. So these kids came in, they had a simple febrile seizure. One group they initially got antipyretics in the ER, but then were told for home to do 10 mg per kilo of rectal acetaminophen every six hours for the next 24 hours. The other group was told not to give antipyretics at all the next 24 hours. And do keep in mind that the AAP does recommend the use of antipyretics, not necessarily to bring the fever down, but for the comfort of the child. The primary outcome they were looking at the recurrence of febrile seizure in the same febrile illness, secondary outcomes, what were factors, rectal acetaminophen use, age, the duration of seizure, or rectal acetaminophen use, and the age. And for their primary outcome, they found that 9% of the kids that got the round-the-clock rectal acetaminophen had another febrile seizure in that next 24 hours, compared to almost 24% in the group that got no antipyretics. And the number needed to treat was about seven to prevent one recurrence. Secondary outcome, they found the most important factor was rectal acetaminophen. So the take home on this, this is still an opportunity for us to reassure our families, even though it's very scary to the observer that febrile seizures are generally very well tolerated. If, it doesn't mean they're gonna go on after one to have epilepsy, if it's going to reoccur, it would be within the next 24 hours, and that we think possible routine antipyretics can help. Now, we can likely extrapolate this study's um, results to oral acetaminophen and oral ibuprofen as well. So also, we talked about the diarrhea before, so the highest risk for febrile seizure recurrence, this was really fascinating to find, was so those diarrhea, they excluded those kids, but they still kind of followed them, and 35% of them had another febrile seizure, higher than the control group that didn't get any antipyretics. So telling parents if they're presenting with a febrile diarrheal illness and a febrile seizure, there's a one in three chance the next 24 hours they're gonna have another febrile seizure. And perhaps this is a real group to give the antipyretics to as well. So what we wanna do, we wanna talk to the parents. Are they comfortable with giving suppositories? Or do they want us to do oral acetaminophen or oral ibuprofen? But picking one so we avoid medication errors. <coughs> Personally, I would pick oral ibuprofen. Documenting on their discharge instructions the right preparation, dosing, and having their weight on there as well in pounds, the time they last got a dose in the ER as well, all to avoid errors. And then picking one and giving it every six hours of still febrile for the first 24 hours. And please do not withhold antipyretics, or Dr. O'Meara would be very unhappy with you. Okay, from the Journal of Pediatrics, risk of death in infants who have experienced a brief, resolved, unexplained event. This was a meta-analysis. So, who here is familiar with the term brew or brewy, whatever you want to call it? Okay. So we're not talking about this brew, but the new kind of acronym created by the AAP back in 2016. Another new name for ALTI. Who here is familiar with ALTIs, right? So these are the less serious, low-risk ALTIs. We don't know the cause, but these kids are fine, and there's nothing really to worry about with them. Well, these, and I want to know too, for these low-risk brews, how many of you are sending these kids home from the ED? Well, let's talk about this. What is a low-risk brew? Well, you have to have, you have to be at least over 60 days of age, and 
gestational age of 32 weeks or older and a post-conceptional age of 45 weeks or higher, that this was your first episode and you didn't have a history of one, that it only lasted less than a minute and you didn't need CPR by a trained medical professional. Also, you were low risk if there were no concerning findings on history or physical as well. So this was a meta-analysis of 12 observational studies and the studies were from the US, Canada, UK, Italy, and Israel, and the authors did say that the risk of death may be different in different parts of the world. And they found 12 deaths. Eight were within four months of the event. And they concluded that the risk of death within four months after an ALTI was one in 800. And that this is likely the upper bounds on the probability of death after a low risk brew. And this is the same as the risk of death in the first year of life. And this really, this meta-analysis really does support the AAP's recommendation back in 2016 to consider sending these kids home, not admitting them or transferring them um, for low risk brew. So the take home, consider sending home your lower risk brews, still trust your gut, perform shared decision making with the family. Dr. Scruggs, a good Sam, will be happy that you did. All right, from clinical pediatrics, failure of outpatient management with different observation times after racemic epinephrine for croup. This was John just up the road at Nemour DuPont Children's Hospital. They wanted to figure out how long do we need to keep these kids around after getting one racemic epineph for croup. It's a retrospective chart review over 300 kids, and they defined failure as if you needed a second racemic epineph or you had to come back to the ER for croup within the next 24 hours. And they compared a two to three hour observation time versus a three to four hour observation time. And they found that the two to three hour group had a higher rate of treatment failure, which was statistically significant. You can see here a large number of patients under three hours needed a second racemic epinephrine. All these kids got steroids too, I should mention. And then a smaller but still notable amount required a second racemic epinet between the three to four hour time period. So take home, observe for at least three to four hours after getting a, giving a racemic epinet for croup. Sorry, Dr. Hager, we need to keep these kids around a little bit longer. <laughs> Another respiratory article, pilot clinical trial of high flow oxygen therapy in children with asthma in the emergency department from the Journal of Pediatrics. So this was a prospective randomized pilot trial over three years, and we're familiar with the use of high flow for bronchiolitis in ED, even though we need more evidence-based guidelines for the emergency department. Um, but this is really the first for using high flow for peds asthma in the ED. 62 kids, they were ages 1 to 14, who had moderate to severe asthma exacerbations. It was conducted in this tertiary academic peds ED in Spain, it's hard to imagine anyone being sick here or ever getting any work done. But what was really interesting about their department was they only saw kids 14 and under, and they had 60,000 visits a year, and 5% of which were from asthma. I find that fascinating. So after getting three NEVs and two per kilo of steroids, if their pulmonary score was six or higher, their SAT was under 94%, they then randomized them to a high flow group versus a conventional O2 group. And their primary outcome was if you had a decrease in that pulmonary score of two or more in the first two hours. And they found that the high flow patients had a higher improvement in their score compared to the controls. They also compared, looked at the disposition, length of stay, need for additional therapies, and they found no significant differences between the groups. And also the high flow group had no side effects as well. So we need more studies on this. Keep your eyes out for this. And Dr. Reed will be checking on this for Southern Maryland as well. Now, this is the study that's not from 2018. This just came out in February of this past year, but I really wanted to include it because it gives us all a lot of hope. So from JAMA Pediatrics, a clinical prediction rule to identify febrile infants 60 days and younger at low risk for serious bacterial infection. Again, done by the PCARN group, led by my idol, Nate Kupperman, sorry, Rahul. Um, <laughs> so 
The goal of their study was really to reduce unnecessary LPs, antibiotic exposure, and hospitalizations on these patients. You may be familiar, how many of you, with the step-by-step -step algorithm from Europe in 2016? So the difference between this step-by-step -step and this study, this step-by-step -step included kids 22 days of age to 90 days, whereas the study we're talking about is zero to 60 days. So the, they wanted to derive and validate a prediction rule that could help identify febrile infants under 60 days of age at low risk for SBIs or serious bacterial infections. It was a prospective observational study over two years in 26 emergency departments. They derived the rule in about 900 infants and then validated it on kids who side by side were getting full fever workups on about 900 as well. Ended up with 1,800 febrile infants. 170 of those had a serious bacterial infection. 30 of those had bacteremia or bacterial meningitis. And what did the rule include? to be low risk if you had a normal urinalysis, an ANC of 4,090 or under, and a serum procalcitonin, 1.7 or under. How many of you here have procalcitonin in real time for your ED? Nice, we'll talk about that. So the rule had a high sensitivity, negative, a very high negative predictive value, reasonable specificity, and a small potential false negative rate and no infants with bacterial meningitis were missed. Still, we cannot forget the importance of HSV. Their rate was about 0.2% kids with HSV, which is similar to other studies. Now, for patients that were missed, there were just three. Two had a UTI, and interestingly, they had a negative UA. They were in the low risk group, and their other labs were low risk, so I wonder if it was just asymptomatic bacteria. The one with enterobacter bacteremia, their blood culture alarmed at about um, 17 hours. But the authors do suggest and say that they had a very low rate of invasive infections in their group. And they suggest further validating their rule on a group that may have more invasive infections. So that's one silver lining to the amount of anti-vaxxers that are coming out there. I know, too soon. Okay. So take home, we may have better prediction tools soon. Talk to your lab, beg to get stack procalcitonin. So at Georgetown, I've been begging the lab for about a year now, and I think in the next two months, they keep telling me though, two months, next two months, um, that we'll be getting it in real time. Continue to have extreme caution though in that under 28 and under age group. These kids still need a full workup. We're not getting away from that hospitalization prophylactic antibiotics, and don't forget HSV as well. All right, we're on to my last one here. So this study from the Journal of Pediatrics and Child Health. Everything is awesome, don't forget the Lego. You're like, what is this about? Well, this is actually a study on foreign body ingestion, which is a very common presentation to the ED for us. I just saw some number going around in the mainstream media that last year there was a 4% increase in the rate of swallowed objects in kids. Um, and that average is out to like 100 per day coming to the ED. So the authors of this article wanted to study the transit times of small, low-risk ingested items. So what did they pick? A small Lego head. So they recruited six pediatric providers, for, this was in Australia, to all swallow a small Lego head <laughs> at the same time of day, no one was on night shifts. You were excluded if you had a history of gastrointestinal surgery, you could not swallow for an object, and also if you had an aversion to checking through your own fecal matter. <laughs> so, I'm actually recruiting to expand this study here, MedStar, so if you're looking for a night shift reduction, you can come and see me afterwards. All right. Is that still actual size? <laughs> now, they also... They also standardized pre 
ingestion bowel habits ah, with the shack score. So the stool hardness and transit time. And then they recorded the time it took for the Lego to be found, and that was called the fart score. <laughs> found in retrieve time, which averaged about 1.7 days. I'm totally comfortable saying these terms to a large group. I have two boys now, so it's like routine. Um, and like you, when I first read this study, I thought it was a joke. But this is true, it's real study. We're gonna send it to you along with all the other articles as well. Now the authors did also suggest there was some evidence that females were more accomplished in searching their stools. But they could not statistically validate this because there was one guy who could not find the Lego head in his stool for up to two weeks. So all joking aside, we still need to remember what is harmful. You guys know this, disc button batteries, multiple magnets, sharp foreign bodies over six centimeters. But we can reassure parents, smaller, lighter toys are going to likely pass. We don't need to torture them by saying, check the stools. And they don't need serial x-rays as well. We do need to remember, though, that pediatricians can't have a sense of humor. <laughs> it's a real study. So thank you. I hope you learned something today and had a little fun. <laughs>